Hello, and welcome to the Songwriters Workshop. This is the series where I attempt to write songs based on the process and techniques of famous songwriters. Each video looks at a different songwriter's writing habits, musical inspirations, and creative process, while also including an original song written using those techniques. So let's take a look at our next songwriter. This video will look at David Byrne. David was born in Scotland, grew up in Maryland, and attended art school at the Rhode Island School of Design. Art plus student equals poor. While in Rhode Island, he would meet drummer Chris Franz and bassist Tina Weymouth. Eventually, the trio would all drop out of school and move to New York City, where they would form the band Talking Heads in 1975. Talking Heads would get their first gig in the June of 1975, opening up for the Ramones at the famous CBGB's bar in the East Village. They would add keyboardist slash guitarist to Jerry Harrison to the band in 1977 for the release of their first album, Talking Heads 77, which featured their first semi-hit, Psycho Killer. For their next two albums, Talking Heads would enlist the help of producer Brian Eno. Between recording their third and fourth album, David and Eno did their own album, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, released in 1979 and 80, which was an experimental mix of looped electronic music coupled with found sounds, including the mixing and matching of sampled vocals from other songs into their tracks. The experimental process of Bush of Ghosts would lead David and Eno to bring some of those processes into the next Talking Heads album, Remain in Light, released in 1980, which includes another major Talking Heads staple in the song once in a lifetime. Talking Heads would split with Brian Eno after Remain in Light and go on a three-year hiatus before returning to record the album Speaking in Tongues, released in 1983. Speaking in Tongues would feature the band's biggest hit in Burning Down the House. The band would record three more albums together before breaking up in 1991. After the breakup, David would continue to have a thriving solo career, delving into world music with albums and tours featuring Afro-Cuban and Brazilian music, along with brass and orchestral music. He has also had collaborations with the likes of electronic dance duo Express 2, indie rock artist St. Vincent, and co-writing a stage musical with DJ Fatboy Slim, based on the life of former first lady of the Philippines, Imelda Marcos. Most recently, David released the album American Utopia in 2018, whose subsequent touring show would make its way to the Broadway stage, featuring fully choreographed numbers and multiple onstage musicians. I would highly suggest the film version of this performance directed by Spike Lee. The research for this video will come from David's book on music, How Music Works. In it, David talks about where our music comes from, why it's recorded and presented in a certain way, and his own experience with music. In the preface, David says, How music works, or doesn't work, is determined not just by what it is in isolation, if such a condition can ever be said to exist, but in large part by what surrounds it, where you hear it, and when you hear it. How it's performed, how it's sold and distributed, how it's recorded, who performs it, whom you hear it with, and of course, finally, what it sounds like. These are the things that determine not only if a piece of music works, if it successfully achieves what it set out to accomplish, but what it is. So let's get started. I started with music, and I'll get into why and how in a moment, but first I want to touch on an important part of David's musical philosophy that he lays out in the book. David says, Context largely determines what is written, painted, sculpted, sung, or performed. That doesn't sound like much, but it's actually the opposite of conventional wisdom, which maintains that creation emerges out of some interior emotion, from an upwelling of passion or feeling, and that creative urge will brook no accommodation, that it simply must find an outlet to be heard, read, or seen. I believe that we unconsciously and instinctively make work to fit pre-existing formats. What David means by this is that what your work ends up being largely depends on what context you expect it to be directed through. You'd write differently if you knew it was going to be performed at CBGB's or Carnegie Hall, or if it was going to be passed along orally like folk songs or through a recording. David gives many more examples of this in the book, especially as it relates to how dance has influenced how music is written. He continues, 
In a sense, we work backwards, either consciously or unconsciously, creating work that fits the venue available to us. In a sense, the space, the platform, and the software makes the art, the music, or whatever. For me, in this context, I have the benefit of knowing that for this song, I will be recording multiple tracks in my home studio with electric instruments to be presented online. With this, I know I can create multiple textures and layers that I wouldn't have written if I knew I would be performing this song with a guitar in a cafe. David clarifies that it is, of course, not just the context of how music is written that shapes a song, but also the passion of the writer, saying, in my experience, the emotionally charged content always lies there, hidden, waiting to be tapped. And although musicians tailor and mold their work to how and where it will be best heard or seen, the agony and the ecstasy can be relied on to fill whatever shape is available. So emotion and context work in tandem to create effective songs, but context has definitely shaped how music works for its time and place. As David puts it, it seems that creativity, whether birdsong, painting, or songwriting, is as adaptive as anything else. Genius, the emergence of truly remarkable and memorable work, seems to appear when a thing is perfectly suited to its context. So, now that we've talked about why a song is written a certain way, let's look at how David and the Talking Heads wrote theirs. For this exercise, I decided to focus specifically on how they recorded Remain in Light, since they had a unique approach to writing the album that I hadn't explored yet. Coming off their experience writing Bush of Ghosts, along with their love of funk and Afrobeat, especially Fela Kuti, David and Brian Eno had the talking head start by having one or two people lay down a track, usually some kind of repetitive groove that would last about four minutes, the presumed length of a song. Others would then respond to what had been put down, adding their own repetitive parts, filling in the gaps and spaces for the whole length of the song. David continues explaining, After the tracks began to fill up, or when the sound of them playing simultaneously was sufficiently dense, it was time to make sections. While the groove usually remained constant, different combinations of instruments would be switched on and off simultaneously at given times. One group of instruments that produce a certain texture and groove might eventually be nominated as a verse section, and another group, often larger sounding, would be nominated as the chorus. So I started coming up with grooves and riffs to layer on top of each other, often responding to the one I had just played or filling in a blank space. And I tried to not just play the riff a few times and loop those same bars over and over when creating my song, since as David puts it, Digital loops and sampling didn't exist yet, but by playing the same part over and over, one could create a rhythmic and hypnotic textural bed that could be manipulated and layered over later. And playing the same riff over and over for several minutes did have a hypnotic and meditative effect on me, especially on the guitar and bass parts. Once I had my grooves and riffs recorded, I started creating sections using David's technique of muting certain instruments at certain times to create different textures. David notes that one of the ways that makes this method of songwriting unique is that, often in these songs there is no real key change. The bass line tended to remain constant, but one could imply key modulations, illusory chord changes, which were very useful for building excitement while maintaining the trance-like feeling of constant root notes. He continues, How did this recording process affect the music? A lot. Complex chord changes of the sort one might hear in ordinary pop songs, bossa novas, or standards were unlikely. Usually there were no chord changes at all. Such devices are often employed to keep a song interesting. But only using one chord has its advantages too. More emphasis gets placed on the groove. Even if a given song wasn't particularly aggressive rhythmically, the groove tended to feel insistent, and you noticed it more. Not only were these tracks groove-centered, they were also very much about texture. The changes from one section to another were sometimes driven more by textural variation than by melody or harmony. And this method is by far not the only way David has ever written songs. In the book, he goes over many different ways a song can be created, from bringing in finished songs to the recording session, 
starting with words or stitching together different riffs. But using the remain in the light method was an interesting way to create a playground for my creativity. My final step before writing my lyrics was to write the vocal part, but how do I do this without words? As David says, when these sections had been created, Eno or I would go into the studio and sing to them, improvising wordless melody. We then did mixes of these songs, including these gibberish vocals, for everyone to listen to while I took them home to write actual words. If you've seen my other videos, you may know this isn't my preferred way to write vocal melodies or words, but I gave it a shot and I'm actually getting more used to it. I think this advice from David helped orient me in the right direction. He says, Sometimes I would sing the melodic fragments over and over, trying random lyric phrases, and I could sense when one syllable was more appropriate than another. I began to notice, for example, that the choice of a hard consonant instead of a soft one implied something, something emotional. A consonant wasn't merely a formal decision. It felt different. So I'd listen to the gibberish vocals respectfully and let those be my guide. For an example of this, here is a section of my gibberish scratch track for the end of my chorus. And here is what the lyrics ended up being. It can feel like it all happens over and over and over and over. So feeling what these scratch tracks were trying to tell me became an important part of how I would write my lyrics. As David puts it, music tells us things. Social things, psychological things, physical things about how we feel and perceive our bodies in a way that other art forms can't. It's sometimes in the words, but just as often the content comes from a combination of sounds, rhythms, and vocal textures that communicate in ways that bypass the reasoning centers of the brain and go straight to our emotions. So listening to my gibberish scratch tracks on repeat, I started coming up with my lyrics. David tends to focus his lyrics about what is happening around him in the world and his reactions to those events. He says, Talking Head songs were still mostly about self-examination, angst, and bafflement at the world we found ourselves in. Psychological stuff. Inward-looking clumps of words combined with my slightly removed anthropologist from Mars view of human relationships. Famously, David has used everything from radio preachers to the Watergate hearings as inspirations for songs so I decided to focus my song around similarly occurring events that we have been living through in the past half a decade. When I started, I didn't know the specifics of where my song was heading, but I tried to put myself in the mindset of thinking about how an outsider would react to what has been happening. Furthermore, David says of relationships to songs that, it's assumed that everything one utters or sings or even plays emerges from some autobiographical impulse. Nonsense. It doesn't matter whether or not something actually happened to the writer. On the contrary, it is the music and the lyrics that trigger the emotions within us, rather than the other way around. We don't make the music. It makes us. As I wrote, I did start to pick up on the direction that my lyrics were heading, something David said would happen. He says, I found that, remarkably, solving the puzzle of making words and phrases fit existing structures often resulted, somewhat surprisingly, in words that have an emotional consistency and sometimes even a narrative thread, even though the aspects of the text weren't planned ahead of time. How does this happen? After filling lots of pages with non sequiturs, I would scan them to see if lyrically resonant groups emerged. Phrases that would hint at the beginning of an actual subject often seem to want to emerge. When some phrases, even if collected almost at random, begin to resonate together and appear to be talking about the same thing, it's tempting to claim that they have a life of their own. The lyrics may have begun as gibberish, but often, though not always, a story in the broadest sense emerges. 
Listening to what the music and words were telling me, I completed my song. As David says, when we write, we access different aspects of ourselves, different characters, different parts of our brains and hearts. And then, when they've each had their say, we mentally switch hats, step back from accessing our myriad selves, and take a more distanced and critical view of what we've done. We've often heard this process described by creative folks as channeling, or just as often people refer to themselves as a conduit for some force that speaks through them. I suspect that the outside entity, the god, the alien, the source, is part of oneself, and that this kind of creation is about learning how to listen and to collaborate with it. So that was the demo of my song. And after going through the process that David, Eno, and Talking Heads used to record Remain in Light, I am amazed at the variety and complexity they were able to achieve with the album. My biggest struggle with writing the song was finding new and interesting things to add to the static landscape. But, as David said, the hypnotic repetitiveness and groove-centered feeling of the song had its advantages, and pushed me creatively. Let me know in the comments if this is a process you have used or are planning to use to write a song. And be sure to check out David's book, How Music Works. There's a ton more information in the book that I didn't cover, and it's well worth your time. Thank you for watching. 
please be sure to like and subscribe to the channel for more videos in the future. I'll see you at the next song.